What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to the Athletes to Athletes podcast. Today, we have a roundtable between myself, Reed, and Justin, and we dig into diversity in sports, specifically, not just the athletes. As you can see in the NBA and the NFL, diversity is really not a problem. But when it comes to the front office and the coaches, it's a little bit different. We dig into that along with some other things and what we think can help change the way that these different front offices can operate and start hiring a little bit differently and looking at people that can do these jobs. So hopefully you enjoy our conversation today. Fellas, good to good to be here once again. Always good to be sitting down and talking with you fellas about dope topics. And today's dope topic is diversity in sports, which is like, let's be honest, it's crazy to say diversity in sports because when you watch basketball, you watch football, I mean, 70% of the NFL, at least 7% of the players, it might even be more than that, are, you know, black diverse players. Um, same thing with the NBA, it's even more. So like, there's obviously certain sports um, like, you know, wrestling that aren't as diverse, but have continued to pick up and become more diverse. Now, when we started talking about like, what topics are we going to talk about today? And I say, why not diversity in sports? What was on my mind was not so much the athletes, but the coaches, the front offices, um, the overarching hierarchy of sports is not very diverse, you know? So that's the, the hardest part. I mean, Brian Flores now with his lawsuit against the NFL, um, there's not <clears throat> very many black coaches in the NFL, which, you know, obviously is a big deal. Um, and it's something that people are looking to change or looking at changing the Rooney rule because everybody is looking at more at, as a box to check instead of something that is truly put in place to make you think outside the box of normal candidates when it comes to, you know, let's not call it nepotism, but, you know, when you get jobs in certain places, it's all about who you know, and a lot of the times less about what you know. Um, you know, the three of us are literally bought together because we know each other, but we also know that each one of us knows what we're talking about. So like, while I think that the knowing what we know and being as intuitive and, and intelligent as we are, and I use the word intelligent very loosely because we're, you know, kind of the three stooges, but like, let's, you know, call it what it is. We came together because we, you know, we have a common mind and common thoughts and we'd like each other if you didn't like me or if you didn't like justin reed or if reed didn't you know if justin didn't like reed there's no way that this is happening right now so relationships definitely rule things more than you know what you know it's definitely more about who you know but like when it comes to bringing in the diverse voices in sports you're seeing more of the espn commentators that are talking about things, they're former players. And most of the time when they're former players, they are going to be former black players, Ryan Clark, you know, Booger McFarlane, these types of guys, Tony Dungy, these types of guys are now becoming talking heads after being on the field or, you know, as a player or as a coach or whatever else, but the overarching kind of look of the front office isn't changing. When you guys hear about, you know, you look at the, the NFL and it's like, at one point, there was one black coach. What types of thoughts for you kind of resonate? Because, you know, obviously of the three of us, I'm the one that grew up with the most diverse background. So I look at that and I'm like, well, I know there's qualified black coaches. I know there's qualified diverse coaches that can do these jobs. Why are they not getting looked at? For you guys, you know, what kind of goes through your mind and read, I want to pose the question to you because within baseball, baseball on the, the MLB level is pretty diverse college level, probably not as much. So, you know, the diversity in sport angle, I want to pose to you read as a college athlete, what was it like and how diverse was the atmosphere that you were in playing at tech or anywhere else that you played? 
Yeah, for sure. So for me, and exactly you said, baseball is is fairly fairly diverse. And, and coming from Texas, you know, we there is a lot of um, Hispanic influence in, in in a lot of the leagues that I played in, and a lot of the teams that I played for, which for me was basically an access to diversity. I mean, I went to a private school, which you know, pay to play, predominantly white. Um, so that was sort of my, my access to, to diversity throughout my childhood for the most part. Um, and in college, it, it, I mean, I, it's sad to say, I want to say we had a pretty diverse team, but if I really sit down and think about it, we were probably 70% white, 30% minority. Mm-hmm. Um, and for a baseball team, that's, it feels like that's kind of the standard at, at the college level, at least and, and in some of the other places. Now, you're absolutely right. I think when you get up to the pros, it, it certainly expands um, and you have a much you have a much more diverse pool. I think that's the international intrigue of the sport. But I also think it's because the way the minor leagues are set up in the MLB, it's not a it's not an expensive thing to do. These mm-hmm. guys get paid nothing. They just stick them on a bus. They float them around. It's it, it, it's a, it is a lifestyle, to be quite honest, that people who went to the private schools and did whatever else can't really handle. They, they, they struggle with the 12 hour bus rides to get paid 200 bucks a week to go play sports. And it's just not what they, it's not what they expect. And they, and they get overwhelmed by it because there, there's a level of, I think, comfortability and pomp that they, that they expect and in that environment. So, um, and it needs some grit to it. A little bit, yeah. I mean, to be honest with you, it's it's almost, yeah. The the diversity pool I think expands because the the barrier to entry is is lowered. As weird and kind of disappointing as that is to admit, that's I think a lot of why you have a larger diversity pool in the MLB minor leagues than you do at say a college level. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and and, and like I said my background in football and, and wrestling wrestling's not, it's probably, it's definitely more diverse than it used to be um, where, you know, last year, half of the NCAA wrestling champions were black. Half of them were. And that was like an incredible feat because it's not something that we're truly used to being in a, you know, predominantly white sport. And you had a lot of people coming out and saying, well, why is this being celebrated? Why is this, why is that? It's like, if you can't celebrate diversity within your sport, then you're not truly about the sport growing. And that's like a huge thing to me when I look at wrestling, because, you know, working, working for flow wrestling, it's always, you know, we want to grow the sport. You know, that was the thing when, when, you know, when, you know, each one of us worked at flow and specifically when I'm working at flow wrestling, that's like the thing. We want to grow the sport. We want to grow the sport. But then when the fan base sees that, you know, Black Wrestler Association um, is celebrating the fact that, and not just them, but, you know, the good portion of the community is celebrating the fact that, you know, there are five Black wrestlers that won NCAA titles during the same year, and they take a picture together to kind of commemorate that. And you have people saying, well, why is this a thing? The other five were white. Should we, should we talk about that as well? And it's like, that happens every year. You, you, don't, you don't really make a big deal of the moon coming out at night if, you know, if it's not a big, if it's not something that doesn't happen all the time. But when you see an eclipse or you see something else, that's a big deal because it's, it's not something that we're used to happening. It's not something that, that you always see every single night. So celebrating diversity to me means truly celebrating the fact that your sport is growing because at one point it was dominated by, you know, let's call it one race essentially. And, you know, and, and that's not a bad thing, but when you start to see these other races and, you know, Iowa had a a racial, a racial situation uh, a couple weeks ago with, you know, racial slurs being hurled at a, at a Wisconsin wrestler and his family being called things while they were at Carver Hawkeye. So like the, they're, you know, they had to investigate these things and whatever else, like that's a, that's a very big deal. So as you have 
things being celebrated and strides being taken to diversify these different sports, such as wrestling. You also have people that want to kind of pull you back to what it used to be and, you know, hurling racial slurs at a wrestler who's maybe, you know, antagonizing a little bit, but not antagonizing to the point where he needs to get ridiculed. His family needs to be ridiculed in that way. So with wrestling, like I said, that's the, that's where I came from. My dad was a wrestler. My dad was a wrestler during a very different time. You know, my uncle was a wrestler and my uncle was a professional boxer. Like boxing is a sport that, you know, used to be a little bit more dominated by, you know, minorities or at least by, by black boxers with during my uncle's time. Now it's way more diverse and it's just, how do you get these other sports to become more diverse and it was sad to me to see people questioning why celebrating five black NCAA champions is a big deal it was sad to me for people to kind of push back and say why is the HBCU wrestling initiative doing what it's doing or why is BWA doing what it's doing or the things that happened with Austin Gomez from Wisconsin last week or a couple weeks ago in Carver Hawkeye it's just like why are these things happening? And then people want to talk about Iowa and their state and call them whatever names, but it's like, you guys aren't helping. You're really not like, that's, that's just not how things should be going. If you want to help the situation, then you try and talk to people. You don't hurl slurs and different, you know, uh, ridicule back at them. I understand. And I've been in that situation where I've been called a racial slur during a game happened plenty of times with me growing up but like as badly as I wanted to beat people up and as much as I probably did take a swing as a player I realized as a 34 year old man you can't do all that so you know Justin for you growing up in Iowa was probably very different than me growing up in Easton what oh no doubt the athletic atmosphere like for you growing up in Iowa I mean I grew up in small town Iowa and zero diversity like I I joked with y'all before the call but like Reed knows this story but I didn't actually talk to a person of color until I was like I have a conversation until I was 16 years old and that was like at a summer camp that I went to so like wasn't even in my town right so like that is the environment and and that's it's still sort of the reality of small town america like it's become a little more diverse Mm -hmm. but you know unless you're in a you know a a town with a community college or or a organization that um supports diversity and brings more diverse families to the to the area like a lot of times in states like iowa or nebraska or you know pick your very rural agriculturally farm heavy you know diversity has never been sort of the strong suit or the uh general appeal uh, for, for that. So growing up, you know, I played sports all through high school and, you know, I, there was no diversity. It's me. Uh, they all look like me. Um, and really just trying to, you know, going, I went, again, I went to the university of Iowa. Um, and that was like my first, you know, sort of foray into like, oh yeah, like different cultures, different thoughts, different, different viewpoints on the world. But when you live in those, you grow up and you live in those small town environments, like it becomes the, the culture of that small town becomes who you are as, as a, as a human being. Yeah. And it's, you know, you, you, you know, talk about the Iowa um, story as far as like the racial slurs and the, one of the problems with, it's not a problem. One of the, one of the ramifications of living in small towns, growing up in small towns or staying in a certain area for 20, 30 years is that you identify with what, you love about that place Mm -hmm. and it's not necessarily the reality of like the situation you're surrounded you're surrounding with right like you cheering for you you performing in a way that in 1985 would have been socially acceptable is not necessarily the case in 2022 and it doesn't give you the right to do it it just it but change is difficult for anybody uh Mm -hmm. let alone somebody who's been doing the same thing for 20 years 20 30 years so um it's a different appeal like for as far as small town life there are there are positives and negatives but one of the negatives is you surround yourself with people who are like-minded because there's there's only so many people as opposed to some you know living in austin texas or you know philadelphia or dallas or new york there are a lot of cultures a lot of ideas a lot of uh opinions a lot of uh stimulants that that 
make you more of a more well-rounded person mm-hmm. as opposed to um you know one sort of in one sort of nomenclature of of this is how my life works uh in a, in a vacuum yeah and we've heard from two of the the women that i've interviewed anna glenn as well as brown dubose about mm-hmm. the atmospheres like that right so yeah. like Anna said she went off to UCLA and, you know, there were other people that were from her ethnicity and that felt so great. And it wasn't even something that was on her list. And Brianna, right, cause she didn't know about, about it, right? Yes. Like she lived in, Car- in South Carolina, correct? She's from North Carolina. Yeah. North, North Carolina. Yeah. So North yep. Carolina. Right. So like she, she was adopted. <laughs> she lived in this environment and was sort of protected by this environment and her mm-hmm. family. And then she goes to UCLA and she's like, Oh, this is a whole world that I didn't even know existed. Yeah. But like despite, despite being from China and, yeah. and coming to the States as a, what I think she said 15 month old or something like that. She was adopted to, you know, white parents and the, the people that you are around can only give you the, that type mm-hmm. of community. They can't give you some other experience that they don't understand. And I think like for her, like she said, when she got to UCLA and it was like, this is, this is what was missing. And she didn't know that it was missing as opposed to Brianna, who in her interview says she's never been a minority on a basketball team. And she got to Penn and she became a minority on a basketball team as opposed to where she had transferred from originally. Mm -hmm. Right. So like, there's two different types of culture shocks that we've already heard about and learned about but like, you know, and, and now I, I want to get back to like what you said, Justin, is like when you got to Iowa, that's when you have, you're around more athletes where they're recruiting the entire country. Yeah. What's your culture shock moment when you get onto campus and obviously, you know, other people exist in the world. You're not naive to that, but you get on campus and now it's just like, now I'm in a completely different world. How it's do so I navigate uncomfortable. this? And, yeah. you know. it's. But I think I think most college, most kids that go to college have the same experience, unless you go to like, you know, the, the your hometown school or like you have a network of friends that went there. Like for a lot of people, a lot of athletes specifically were like myself, where mm-hmm. you go to school and regardless of how close it is to home, you know, nobody, yeah. right? And so you're really just starting over. And from a socially, uh, awkward standpoint you're just like I don't know how to communicate with people outside of my small circle of bubble that I had in my for me in my small town right so it's like how do I you know specifically like that there was the start of social media when I went to school like now it's probably even worse but like how do I communicate engage find common ground um without being so over the top or intrusive, right? And really, how did you to build, how did I, you figure out that it was a lot easier than you were making it out to be? It took me it took me like a year. It, it took me it took me probably. I mean, I I had my core classes and my core like club groups that I like would go to, and I played intramural in college, uh, and that helped. But like going out and meeting people and trying to build relationships, like that took me six to twelve months to try to figure that out because you're in a new space. You're you're now an adult. You gotta figure stuff out like you don't have the support system that you went from um and you're completely overthinking it is what i'm getting yeah yeah absolutely oh that's how (laughs) that's how my life is anyway but a lot of it ended up just being trial and error of like get out of your own head and just go talk to people right yeah it's not that that hard no it's not that hard but it's a skill set that is not necessarily innately uh taught and or honed in this day and age but it def but it it still wasn't back when, you know, I was, when I went to college, as far as small town America, right? Like you, you've known everybody and it's still the case when I go home, you know, everybody in the town, you don't have to work at that. You grew up with those people. And then you, you go from knowing everybody and their story and who their grandma is and what, you know, who owns what business to, I don't know any of these people around me. And there's 30,000 kids on campus, right? It's just, it's a, it's a culture shock that is a fabric part a fabrical part of the college experience and one that I think specifically Reed and I um, have talked about nauseam of like we really want that for kids because it helps you grow as an individual it helps you learn new skills it, it is part of the college experience however it is more difficult for some kids than others based on where they came from 
what the environments they were around and and just the social skills they do or do not have yeah some kids are just naturally communicative some kids are not right when um with us being you know obviously sports fans of all different types of sports looking at front offices and most of the time you have no idea who's really in the front office you know yeah you know you you know jerry jones owns the cowboys because if he could the logo on the helmets would be a picture of him because jerry jones is jerry jones but like you know i obviously know that arthur blank owns the falcons because i am a falcons fan but you don't really know all the other owners and you don't really see the front office a lot of times when you look at your teams and you're like specifically at this point in time where you're talking about the lack of diversity in the coaching ranks when you look at your teams you say well why like why is that like like i said i'm a falcons fan they've never had a black head coach ever they're one of 13 teams in the nfl that have never had a black head coach so i look at that and i'm like that's one that's a point that i didn't even know i'm an absolute diehard fan it's something that i didn't I shouldn't say something I didn't know something I didn't take notice of until it was just like brought to my attention but you I obviously knew because every single year it was you know another white head coach but like Mm -hmm. you don't realize how many teams look that way so when you hear a stat like there's 13 teams that have never had uh, you know a, a head coach a black head coach you start scratching your head a little bit and saying well why is that Mm -hmm. when you know, so I I pose a question to you guys of why do you think it's like this essentially? And I know that's like a million dollar question. It's like the hardest thing ever. And if like anyone could fully figure it out, it would be the NFL front office. Right. Um, And I guess this is, you know, this could be like the last piece of the, the conversation. What do you think the issue is in these big organizations? I honestly think it's, as sad as it is to say, it's not surprising to me. me um, and this is coming from the angle of somebody who grew up in a higher socioeconomic white house in a white community in a big city. Um, ownership and leadership positions in professional sports traditionally has essentially been a generational thing. You talk about, you know, the Bridgestone family, the Kraft family. It's these, it's these huge organizations or these huge companies, these huge families who have generational wealth, who have passed down pieces of, of these teams or, or pieces of these organizations. Jerry Jones, for example. I mean, go down the list, right? Like it's any one of those folks. Mm-hmm. Well, if we want to, if we really just want to call it what it is, like go back 50 years, go back 60 years, how many, how many races in america were thriving generationally at that time from a monetary standpoint from an influence standpoint i mean when we built this thing the folks who really only had a chance to get in on the on the game were primarily white white people just was what it was and then when you are in that position and you own a team or you're in a leadership in a team it, it tends to stay in the family for lack of a better term i mean it, whether it be literally or your close confidants who when you get to a certain place and you're in these little bubbles, it just sort of rotates around the same group of people, right? So you're going to hire your buddy or you're going to hire your cousin or you're going to hire so-and-so's in-law or whatever it might be. And so you've now built up this team of people who all look the same, act the same, think the same. And for you and your little community, we'll use the Falcons, for example, right? And I don't, I don't know Arthur, I don't know any of those people, but like you probably want to surround yourself with folks that you have similar values with similar thoughts on similar whatever and that's easy to do when you just look down the street or look down the road and grab somebody that you know it's an insulated so you, type of thing a hundred percent a hundred percent and so then whenever you have people and we'll take the head coaching for example right like you have multiple coaches come in all of whom i'm sure are extremely qualified you have let's say a brian flores come in he doesn't look like anybody in the room a lot of those folks probably cannot relate to him on a cultural level, on a personal level, on a mindset level, on a lot of different things like that. And then you get insert white dude here come in. <laughs> and they, I mean, seriously, like just rotate them through the damn queue. Yeah. And probably any one of them is going to at least, I mean, just on the, just on the sniff test right off the bat, like they're going to feel more 
comfortable in that environment. So it's this yeah. create like we've created this system, right? And we it's almost as if we built it before anybody of color had an opportunity to like get any skin in the game. Well, if you think about it, like not to be ageist, but like the average age of an NFL owner <laughs> is 69 years old, right? So like take that and cut it with they grew up in a certain era where a certain thing, their certain belief system was instilled to them and they made their wealth and generational wealth either from past generations or during a certain time, right? They have a way of thinking about doing things. This is why the NBA is, I think, has done a better job than the NFL. Partly it was because they have younger ownership and they have multiple owners for, for a team that have different backgrounds, things of nature. You know, I think of the Milwaukee Bucks. I think Yeah, that, it's more, uh, it's more like, leadership uh, yeah, group. Correct, as opposed to the NFL, which is mostly either a single, uh, a single person or a single family, right? Yeah. And so you, you, you know, I don't, I don't want to like, you know, put the Donald Sterling thing out there, right? Because that's not, not necessarily a great uh, example of but it happened. But, like, but it happened, right? And that, but but he grew up, you know, his big thing was like, you know, I, I said these things, you know, X, Y, Z, which were terrible things in the, in the time that they were said. Yeah. However, in 1974, you know, were not necessarily something that was, that would catch anybody's eye, right? You have, you have a group of individuals like ownership that grew up in a certain development mm -hmm. and their brain is programmed a certain way. They're going to think a certain way. And that leads to a, I don't want to say it's not a negative connotation to reach point of though. It's, it's, I'm comfortable with this because I know what this is. Yeah. Right. And the big thing about NFL owners is they want to make as much money as possible and take the least amount of risk possible. And in their mind, what they know is less risky. It's, it's the same thing in a, in a business, right. Ent entrepreneurial or corporate structure, like you take risks to make money, but in order to keep your money, you take less risk. Right. And that's essentially what NFL owners are doing in the hiring process in this conversation is, is potentially just picking things that they think are safer bets that they have less risk and or more control over as far as like a narrative standpoint. Yeah. Well, it's like I said, if we were the ones to figure it out, then we should essentially be right. in the office of the NFL. Um, <laughs> but I don't, I don't think that, you know, you guys are wrong. It's, it's truly an insulated type of deal. I mean, even, and I'll, and I'll flip the script on it. Right. My uncle had multiple businesses for a very long time. My dad was essentially his, you know, second in command for the entirety of him having those businesses. And, you know, when you look around, you know, his training partners, when my, you know, my uncle was fighting his training partners, his, uh, the, uh, his, his trainers, you know, he trained with Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali's entire camp was black guys. You know what I mean? It wasn't, and, and obviously that was a different time, but there were only a select few white guys that were really around in their, in their camp at that point. So like, Certainly, it, as, as it goes the same way for one side, it definitely goes that way yeah. for the other. But when you look at the hierarchy of the, how the systems were put in place, you say, listen, you have to think outside the box. And yeah. you have to be, and if you think that just being insulated with a bunch of yes men that you've been around for your entire life is what is going to get the job done, then you really aren't the businessman you think you are because businessmen take risks and that's how they get to where they are. Right. And I'm not saying that it is risky to hire somebody that is outside of your, your, your race or whatever else. It's risky to these business owners to hire somebody that doesn't look like them because then they feel less insulated and they, they aren't as trustworthy of them. But Brian Flores right. was doing well. And that's the problem is you have these coaches that do very well on this next level and they still get canned. Risk is probably the wrong word that I use. I think, I think the, the bigger point is willingness to adapt to, to the environment they currently live in, right? Yeah. To use your example from, from your, your uncle's standpoint, like he insulated himself with people who he trusted because of the environment that he was in, right? Mm -hmm. I think if, if he was doing the same thing now, like, I think he would still have that past experience to weigh on, but having a willingness to adapt and to have a more of a trust or a um, different viewpoint would be helpful. And he would understand the value of that, right? Where it's, 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 
showing personal development and personal growth and being mm -hmm. able to know, you know, accept your shortcomings from previous iterations of yourself, accept that this is now a new reality and really build on, you know, adaptive of ideas, cultures, technology, you know, add your list of things. All of that is good for business and, and helps uh, generate additional revenue. Now, whether they're willing to do that is a whole other story. Yeah, I can say, and, and this will be the last thing before we, you know, to, to wrap up is that I feel like, you know, just using my, my uncle as, as that example, w as an, as a family, we are very extremely diverse. Um, you know, it, extreme, like it, it doesn't really matter what walk of life you come from business wise, you know, doing business still. So, you know, there's, there's not there and, and you're right a willingness to adapt is certainly what I feel is the hardest thing. And that's where the rigor kind of meets. So no, like I said, if we were the ones to figure it out, then we should be running the NFL. But I think this was a good conversation, fellas. I think we can wrap it here because the recording is probably going to stop soon. Um, but I just think be a good human. Just, just be, be a good, I should have wore, I should have wore that sweatshirt for this episode. Might yeah, be a good, be a good human, hire good people, you know, and, and everything else will fall in line. Certainly. Thank you for listening to the Athletes to Athletes podcast. If you like what you heard, you should check out our Athlete Stories series with athletes like Tope Amade, Anna Glenn, and Brianna Dubos. And obviously, hit that subscribe button so you never miss another episode here at the Athletes to Athletes podcast.